Today, we are going to talk about not one, not two, but three automotive visionaries that are cut from the same cloth, so to speak. Preston Tucker, John DeLorean, Elon Musk. A bit of a background story of how this episode came to be. A couple months back, a viewer asked if I could review a 1948 Tucker. For those that don't know, a 48 Tucker was a huge deal because it was a brand new car. Advertisements said the newest car in 50 years or something to that effect. In my mind, while reading that comment, I was like, yeah, I'll get right on that. 52 cars made, depending on what source you read, 47 to 48 cars remaining, and they cost more than a million dollars. Jay Leno doesn't even have one, and that's saying something. But I like a good challenge. This episode, maybe it's a precursor to something. I'm not saying that I reviewed a Tucker, but maybe I did. The only way to know for sure is to subscribe and hit that bell so you never miss a video. I'm sorry, I had to do that. But seriously, if you like this video, give us a like. I really want to know your thoughts on these three people. Also, what automotive visionaries would you like to see on the channel? I know I'm going to do a video on Virgil Exner, Harley Earl, Bill Mitchell, maybe all at the same time because they were very similar. But they were more or less the same time period. These three are from totally different time periods. Three people, three different time periods, same vision. Preston Tucker, born September 21st, 1903. He died December 26th, 1956. We are going to be on a first name basis with uh, Preston Tucker as well as John DeLorean because their cars are named after them and it would get really confusing if we don't. So we're on a first name basis with Preston. Preston loved cars at, the early, at an early age. And when Preston was 16, he started flipping cars. That means that he fixed them up and sold them for profit. Preston quit high school to pursue a job working as an office boy or a gopher for the Cadillac Motor Car Company. In 1922, he joined Lincoln Park Police Force because he liked driving fast and dangerous and riding in fast cars, and the police department was where he could do that legally outside the racetrack. Speaking of racetrack, in the early 1930s, Preston would go to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which was a pretty far trek for him because he lived in Michigan at the time. He would go there every month. He was very interested in race cars and their designers. Preston would meet Harry Miller, who was the go-to race car guy back in the day. Harry Miller had a carburetor shop as well as he built race engines. He inspired many automotive car companies such as like Duesenberg, Peugeot, Bugatti, Miller, built his own three-liter engine, which had four valves per cylinder and dual overhead cams. That engine actually inspired the Bugatti Type 51, which was the race car that replaced the Type 35 Bugatti. Harry Miller is going to have his own episode one day. We're starting to go down a rabbit hole. Back on topic. Miller went bankrupt in 1933, like a lot of people did. It was the Great Depression. Preston and Miller built race cars together during that time period. In 1935, they formed a company together, Miller and Tucker Incorporated. In the late 30s, they developed the Tucker Combat Car. Tucker Combat Car, the Dutch government actually wanted a combat vehicle that could handle muddy terrain. Preston and Miller started building a prototype. Preston designed a narrow wheelbase armored combat car that was powered by a modified Packard V12 engine. It was nicknamed the Tucker Tiger, but sadly, Germans invaded the Netherlands in the spring of 1940 before Preston could finalize the deal and the Dutch government, they just lost interest in the project. Apparently one Tucker combat car was made. They tried to sell the idea and the design to the U.S. government, but the U.S. government declined and said that it was too fast. Think about that for a second. Evidently, it could go up to 100 miles per hour on a smooth surface and 65 miles per hour in terrain. Tucker developed a turret for the top of the combat vehicle, it's a misconception that he invented the turret in general. It was a specially designed turret to go on the Tucker Combat Vehicle, as well as the Douglas B-18 Bolo, which was a different type of bomber. In 1940, Preston formed the Tucker Aviation Company with the goal of manufacturing aircraft and marine engines. This was a public corporation with stock certificates issued. Tucker raised enough capital to develop and design a fighter 
aircraft, the Tucker XP-57, which earned the interest of the United States Army Air Corps because we didn't have an Air Force at the time, developed a single prototype of an airplane. It was started, it was powered by a straight eight cylinder engine and it was developed by none other than Harry Miller. It was called the Miller L-510. It was nicknamed the Peace Shooter. This fighter competed for World War II government contracts. However, financial problems ensued and essentially the U.S. government let the contract run out. After the war was over, I didn't live during that time period. And there's a reason they are called the greatest generation. They gone without anything new. Everything was rationed. Every Gold was confiscated. It must have been very depressing for three plus years, maybe three or four years, really. This generation, we can't go six months without a new iPhone. I mean, think about that. People wanted, they longed for something new, something different. The big three, they were shut down during this period of time. The government came and said, hey, you're not going to build any cars. You're going to build airplanes. You're going to build guns. You're going to build Jeeps. And they took away all the materials. Like there was no metal. There was no tin. There was no copper. They had steel pennies because there was a copper shortage. It was like that in America for three or four years. It was like that in other parts of the world for longer than that. Not a lot of people know that the, depending on where you are in the world, World War started in 1937 for some people. It didn't start for us until 1942. Pearl Harbor got us into World War II. Anyway, we're getting back on topic here. The big three, they had no intentions of making anything new. They just wanted to freshen up or do a facelift on their pre-war designs. And Preston saw this as an opportunity to get into the automotive game. Preston didn't have a car company or a car reputation for that matter. He could start from the ground up on what he thought or what he thought people would want in a car. Preston thought of safety, which no one thought about at that time. His car, the Tucker 48, was the first car to offer seatbelts, four-wheel independent suspension, all button switches and knobs located just to the left or in right behind the steering wheel so the driver did not have to reach across the car to push a button. A padded dashboard, Preston, to make his automotive dream a reality, leased the Dodge Aircraft plant which was the largest building in the U.S. at the time. To give you an idea of how big this building was, it was 475 acres. It's huge. The facility was used to build the right R3350 Cyclone engines for the B-29 Super Fortress aircraft during World War II. The plant leasing agreement was contingent on raising $15 million by March of 1947. Preston signed the papers July 1946, so that's eight months to come up with $15 million. $15 million is a lot now. I tried to convert this into my calculator converter, and whenever I did, it just said, wow. Preston was able to make a prototype car nicknamed the Tin Goose. Drew Pearson coined that term in reference to uh, Howard Hughes's Spruce Goose. Preston would take the Tin Goose to... Shows like in New York City, they charged a mission to see it. Everywhere the Tin Goose went, it drew a crowd. And Preston Tucker became a household name practically overnight. Preston made 37 cars, which wasn't even a drop in the bucket for the amount of hype that this car had. So we got to stop that story right there and talk about some of the other things that were going on about the same time period. Preston Tucker had to come up with $15 million to keep the company, the plant, so he could build the cars that he wanted to build. He wanted to build 60,000 units a year, and that was the only plant that was big enough to accommodate that that didn't have anybody in it. So to do this, uh, Preston had to be an outside-the-box kind of thinker. Like, he had investors, but the investors only had so much capital. He needed more capital. So he, he found different ways to come up with that capital, and one of the ways was to start selling accessories for his cars, like radios, seat covers, and people who bought the accessories were promised a spot on a waiting list when the cars became available for purchase. He also started selling dealership franchises, and this is where it started get he started getting in a lot of trouble because he had the tin goose, he, he was building the cars at this point, the Tin Goose was the only thing that he had that was hard proof of a car. The S 
EC started looking at his company and him and his practices, and they thought that it was just a giant Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme, that there was no car. He was frauding people out of their money, telling people that dealership or whatever, a dealership franchise, and there was no dealership franchise. So that was their part of it. He was just having a hard time coming up with the money. The straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, for the Tucker automobile was the media. And same goes true today. If they don't like you, they will do everything in their power to make a person, an organization, a corporation seem unfavorable. Drew Pearson was a popular journalist at the time. Same guy who joked and called the Tucker prototype Tin Goose said on his radio broadcast, like it probably doesn't even back up, just ran a negative program on the car. Next day, Tucker's stock was next to zero. Preston could never recover from the bad press. And you think that's bad enough? Oh wait, it gets worse. The SEC took control of everything. They seized all of Tucker's drawings, parts, prototypes, forced the factory to close, which laid off up to 1,600 workers without a job. And common sense would say, if you're paying 1,600 people to do something, that's probably not a Ponzi scheme. But there was a lot of lack of common sense in this whole thing. But there was a lot of things at play. And we're trying to simplify it. Like the big three had a part. The media had a part. The SEC had a part. But I'm just trying to keep everything condensed so that this video is not an hour long. The SEC also indicted Preston Tucker on 25 counts of mail fraud, five counts of violating SEC rules, and one single count of conspiracy to defraud. 300 loyal workers would go back to the factory, some without pay to finish assembling 13 more cars for a total of 51 cars with a prototype. A little bit of a side note, the 52 count comes from evidently they made a convertible prototype. Some say it exists, some say it doesn't exist. That's why I included it on here. Getting back to the lawsuit, the jury found him not guilty on all charges, but the damage was already done. Nobody would buy a car from him because of the bad publicity he got from the Drew Pearson broadcast. And there was a lot of rumors going around and swirling around. You know, when people talk, sometimes people start thinking that that's true. And people thought that of him. And that's what ultimately killed the Tucker was the media. And there was a lot of stuff at play. This is like an onion of a story. There's lots of layers. But despite losing just about everything, his dream of making the newest car in 50 years, Preston Tucker stayed positive. And that positivity continued, but lung cancer ended up taking him at the age of 53, December 26, 1956. I'm going to add one more side note. If you want to see more about Tucker, Preston Tucker's dream, there's a movie called Tucker, The Man and His Dream. It has uh, Jeff Bridges in it. It's an amazing movie. I actually kind of got a little bit emotional towards the end of it because it's very sad. I mean, the guy had ideas, ideas way ahead of their time. And, you know, he wasn't dealt a good hand, as you could see. Like, every single thing that he did got shot down. And it, it was just sad. He was kind of like the Nikola Tesla of automobiles, even though that guy was dealt a really, really bad hand. And he was overshadowed by Thomas Edison back on topic. Anyway, Preston Tucker with the flamboyance that he had was able to restore his image and integrity before he died. So history always remembers him as this flamboyant salesman that could sell ice to Eskimos. Okay, on to the second person. John Z. DeLorean, born January 6, 1925. He died March 19th, 2005. John was born in Detroit, Michigan. He attended Cass Technical High School. He signed up for electrical curriculum. He excelled at it. He went on to study the Lawrence Institute of Technology. World War II interrupted his studies. John was drafted into the United States Army where he served for three years and then he was honorably discharged in 1946. When he returned home, he briefly attended Detroit Law. He didn't graduate. He did graduate from Chrysler Institute of Engineering with a master's degree in automotive engineering. And at the time, he worked part-time for Chrysler on the side. He only worked for Chrysler for maybe about a year. He was offered a job in 1953 by the Packard Corporation, salary of $14,000, which is equivalent to $141,794 now. He reworked their Ultramatic, giving it 
an improved torque converter, and dual drive ranges, and it was relaunched as the Twin Ultramatic. You gotta understand the timing situation at Packard right now isn't the best because it's 1953, Packard is hemorrhaging money bad. They're in a really bad financial turmoil because of the changing post-war market. Packard's president, James Nance, decided to merge with Studebaker. There was talks of merging with AMC, but it never got past the point of the discussion table. John was going to keep his job but moved to Studebaker division, but then he received a call from Oliver K. Kelly, vice president of engineering at GM, who was a person in the automotive world that John looked up to, offered him the job of his choice in any one of GM's five brands. It was an offer that he could not refuse. John went to work for Pontiac in 1956 as assistant chief engineer and worked with Pete Estes. John is the man behind the Pontiac GTO, a car named after the Ferrari 250 GTO. John made Pontiac into the GM performance division juggernaut that it was in the 60s. Before John took the role at Pontiac, there was no real direction for the Pontiac brand. The success of the Pontiac brand was mostly credited to John, and in 1965, John became the head of Pontiac division, which was a huge deal because he was only 40 years old at the time, making him the youngest person to do so up to that point. John had the drive to go all the way to the top of the ladder. He wanted to be president of the company, but a bit of a side note about John. John was known as Mr. Cool, where other executives were kind of stuffy, old hat types. John wore pinstripes, sideburns, owned a Maserati and a Lamborghini, and he hung out with the movie stars. In 1967 and 68, John ran the Pontiac division with record sales for both years. John played a big role in the design of the 230 cubic inch displacement inline six offered in the Firebird. What's so great about an inline six? Well, this one had an overhead cam, which no one was doing in America at that point in time. It produced 215 horsepower, which was 15 horsepower more than the base Mustang V8 that Ford offered. And it really makes you appreciate the three liter Miller engine that Miller built almost 40 years prior to this, and it had dual overhead cams. For the 1969 model year, John turned his focus to the Pontiac Grand Prix, which was Pontiac's personal luxury car. It competed with the Ford Thunderbird, Buick Riviera, Lincoln Continental Mark III, and the Oldsmobile Tornado. John DeLorean went to Pete Estes, his former boss, who is now over at Chevy at the time, to share development costs because Pontiac didn't have enough money to produce a shell on their own. On top of that, John wanted to release the Pontiac before the Chevy one year prior. The deal was done. Estes agreed to let the 1969 Pontiac Grand Prix come out before Chevy's car, which was the Monte Carlo, which came out a year later in 1970. In 1969, John was promoted again, this time to Chevy division. Ed Cole needed someone like John to sort out the mess that was going on over there. The new model Camaro was falling behind schedule. Redesign of the Corvette and Nova were delayed. Quality control issues affected 6.7 million Chevys sold between the years of 1965 and 1969 because of defective motor mounts. John's answer to the problem was to delay the new Camaro, Corvette, and Nova designs and just modify the designs they already had. John used the extra time to streamline Chevy production overhead and reduce assembly cost. By 1971, so in two years, Chevy was experiencing record sales. More than 3 million units sold that year. In 1972, John was appointed vice president of car and truck production of the entire GM line. At this point, the Stiffs, old hats, wanted John to be like them, but John was Mr. Cool Guy. And the other executives didn't much care for that. April 2nd, 1973, John announced that he was leaving the company, telling the press, I want to do things in a social area. I have to do them. And unfortunately, the nature of our business, I, it just didn't permit me to do as much as I wanted. However, it was rumored that he was fired. 
God gives his whole life to a company. Don't worry, they took care of him though. They, they gave him a Florida Cadillac franchise as a retirement gift. John DeLorean decided that he would just do things his own way and make his own company from the ground up. He could do whatever he wanted. He could wear whatever he wanted. He could have his sideburns long. He could be Mr. Cool. His car company, DeLorean Motor Company, or DMC for short, a two-seat sports car appeared in mid-1970s called the DeLorean Safety Vehicle. The car entered production as the DeLorean. The car was, had gall wing doors. It was made out of stainless steel. It was powered by the Doverin V6 engine, which was a collaboration between Peugeot, Renault, and Volvo, a.k.a. the PRV. The car was going to be built in Northern Ireland. Factory turned out about 9,000 cars. In 1980, timing wasn't on John DeLorean's side this time. The DeLorean car didn't make it to market until January of 1981, almost a decade after the company was founded. The new car market slumped due to an economic recession in 1980. This was also compounded by lukewarm reviews by auto critics who felt the uniqueness of the styling didn't live up or compensate for the high price tag, low horsepower. By February of 1982, more than half of the roughly 7,000 DeLoreans produced remained unsold. DMC was hemorrhaging money bad. At this point in time, they were $175 million in debt. The factory consequently was placed in receivership. In January of 1982, the British government learned that DMC built 8,500 cars, which was roughly 23 million pounds, which was almost half of the money John received in 1974. The government gave DMC subsidiaries to build and produce a car there because it would provide jobs to the people that lived there who could work at the factory. So it was a win-win for everybody. Almost half of the funds were transferred into a Panamanium account under a different name, General Product Development Services. That company was intended to subsidize Lotus. The money never made it to Colin Chaplin's Lotus. Side note, Lotus collaborated in the development of the DeLorean car. They, they did a lot of the um, suspension and chassis work. While the DeLorean factory was in receivership in 1982, the factory produced another 2,000 cars for a total of 9,000 cars produced. On October 19th, 1982, John DeLorean was charged by the U.S. government with trafficking cocaine which was orchestrated by the FBI, who set John DeLorean up with 59 pounds of cocaine. Orchestrated is the key word there, and that means John was set up. So we have to kind of stop right there, and we have to talk about what went on to lead up to John DeLorean's arrest in 1982. John was between a rock and a hard place in 1981. Government recession, supply chain issues where the factory in ireland was they were in the middle of a civil war the dmc plant was literally in a war zone the british government gave john delorean a hundred million dollars in subsidiaries to build a car manufacturer plant there because it would create jobs up to 1600 jobs in a place where jobs were scarce John went to investors for more money, tried to put the charm on the British government, which a new person was in charge, Maggie Thatcher, and she wasn't keen on helping John. So John was in a desperate situation. He needed money to keep his car dream afloat. But not only that, close to 1,600 people would be jobless if the DNC went under. James Timothy Hoffman, who was a former neighbor to John, Hoffman was a confidential informant and tipped off the FBI that John approached him to ask him about selling cocaine. When in reality, Hoffman called John and suggested, Hey, John, it's me, James Hoffman. I saw you're having financial problems. I would like to help you with that. Want to make some, want to move some cocaine for me? And John's like, I don't know. That's kind of uh, illegal. I have $6.5 million worth of it now, and a total of 220 pounds worth 24 million to move. What do you say? And John was like, I'm in. Hoffman during this time was actually awaiting trial for federally trafficking cocaine himself in 1981. This was a way for Hoffman to get a reduced sentence. John DeLorean needed $17 million to keep DMC from going under. 
The FBI set John up in a hotel room in Los Angeles, right next to the Los Angeles International Airport. Convenient, right? Undercover agents right next door let themselves into John's hotel room. Now, John was sitting right across from a suitcase full of cocaine. John was arrested. Trial lasted 22 weeks. John defended himself, and he was found not guilty. But while all that was going on, his DMC company went into foreclosure, and it was liquidated. Everything was seized by the British government. That was the end of John DeLorean's car dream. It wasn't the end of the DMC story, however. Universal Pictures used the DeLorean in their sci-fi comedy, Back to the Future, which solidified the DeLorean in pop culture as the time machine. As for John DeLorean, his reputation was tarnished by the whole ordeal, saying, would you buy a car from me? More legal troubles would follow him for decades. He was hit with tax invasion lawsuit in the mid 80s which he was found he was acquitted of all charges as well as countless other lawsuits pertaining to the delorean john delorean subsequently died from a stroke march 19th 2005 uh, side note i didn't go into all the details and i left some aspects on the table if you want to know more about delorean and the story behind the back to the future movie there is a really good documentary that I'm going to link in the description below. It's really long, though. It's about an hour and a half long, but it goes through everything, like the whole setup to the Back to the Future series, if you're into that, as well as John DeLorean and the DeLorean car itself. So be sure to check that out. It was really well done. Okay, last person we are going to cover today, Elon Musk. But be sure to stay till the end because we are going to tie everything together as to why these three individuals are cut from the same cloth. Born June 28th, 1971 in South Africa, Musk moved to Canada at the age of 17 to avoid conception, which was the draft. Musk was enrolled at the Queen's University and then he transferred to the University of Pennsylvania where he received a bachelor's degree in economics and physics. Musk moved to California in 1995 to attend Stanford, but he decided to pursue a business career instead of going to school forever. Musk co-founded a software company called Zip2 with his brother Kimball. The Zip2 company was bought for $307 million in 1999. Also in 1999, Musk co-founded an online bank called XCOM, which merged with Confinity in 2000 to form PayPal, which was bought by eBay in 2002 for $1.5 billion. In 2002, Musk founded SpaceX, which is an aerospace company that takes space travel and rockets in a totally different way. For example, NASA launches a rocket. There is a rocket in a fuel chamber, and uh, the fuel chamber part detaches from the shuttle. Musk saw this as a part of a waste. Why don't we just reuse the rocket? So he made it possible for rockets to land vertical and use them again. And that's a whole nother side of the story. Musk is part of a bunch of different big projects that we could literally talk about all day. But I just wanted to tell you that he started that company before Tesla. In 2004, Elon Musk made a $6.5 million investment into Tesla Motors. The company actually started in 2003, and it was founded by Martin Uberhard and Mark Tarping. Musk became chairman of the company with owning the largest stake in the company. Tesla Motors' first car was the Roadster, and it was um, based on the Lotus Elise. It was basically an electric version of the Lotus Elise. It claimed 200 miles per charge. Tesla produced 2,450 of them from 2008 to 2012. The U.S. EPA rating says the Roadster can travel 244 miles per charge, goes 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds, with a top speed of 125 miles per hour. I need to stop that story for a second because it all seems well happy and perfect, and it's funny how researching a topic, unless one has lived through it, this is, this is the Internet. They can put as many blind spots up on the Internet and show you as much information as they want to show you, but I lived through it. Like, I remember the struggles that he went through to get to there. Um, I was a senior in 2007. And I remember 2008, 2009, 2010 was really hard years on Elon Musk. He had to dump a bunch of his money into the company. 
and the model there was no model s there was no model s there was no model x this was all before it and he was hemorrhaging money bad because everything was expensive the um proof of concept was expensive he was going through crap at Sp spacex rockets weren't landing the way that they were supposed to land on the pad and you know it everything all his hopes and dreams were going up in smoke just like john delorean just like preston tucker but he somehow managed to get through it they were working on the model s and they were taking reservations for the model s it sounds like something preston tucker would do only he would promise the car and the car just kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed till eventually it came out in 2012 and it was a make or break year for tesla model s goes on sale and it it was and is still tesla's flagship halo car it was made completely out of aluminum or most of it was out of aluminum batteries located in the floor for better handling car weighed up to 4960 pounds but because it was electric and depending on the battery pack all the early models were rear wheel drive only the all-wheel drive model didn't come until later Early consumer reports said this car performs better than any car we've ever tested. Not just an electric car, any car we have ever tested. People tend to forget that Musk never really had it easy. Uh, people only see what they want to see and like they see Musk as being the most, you know, depending on when you see this video or when it goes up, him and Bezos have been fighting for richest person in the world for a while now. They keep switching it's either musk is the richest person in the world or jeff bezos the head of uh, amazon corporation is um the richest person in the world but people don't really see all the crap that either one of those people went through to get to the position that they're in now lots of risks very little rewards in the very beginning seems like they're getting rewarded now but they don't they don't take into account the stuff that happened 10 years ago today Tesla makes the Model S, Model X, Model 3, Model Y, Cybertruck's coming, a new Roadster model is coming, and the semi-truck are all in the works. So let's recap. All three of these automotive visionaries, they all have basically the same idea as far as making the best car or the car of tomorrow. Preston Tucker, his vision was to make the car of tomorrow, safety features, affordable price, rear engine, flat floor more room in cars but ultimately he was taken out by the media sec and the big three john delorean his vision to make the perfect car to make the perfect dream car rear engine notice both preston tucker john delorean and elon musk started out with a rear engine car just similarities i'm just trying to point some stuff out gall wing doors on john delorean's car stainless steel so it doesn't rust he took himself out John DeLorean did with the government sting. I mean, he was between a rock and a hard place and he was just trying to keep workers happy, the government happy. He was just trying to keep everybody happy and in the end, it, it ended up costing him his company. Elon Musk, he is what Preston Tucker and John DeLorean would have been if everything went to plan. It's sad because they could have been very successful people had the media not interfered. The media kind of had a role in John DeLorean's thing too. And the media has been trying to take out Elon Musk for a long time. And it's funny that it hasn't happened yet. But um, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. As always, please like, share, and subscribe if you like the content. This episode was a little bit different. And uh, if you liked it, give us a like. If you didn't like it, put it in the comment section below. And I'll never do another episode like this again because it took a really long time to put this together. And uh, till next time, toodaloo!